to go at many times and in many ways. God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. Well, experts in human sleep behavior say that we all dream every night. How many of you remember the dream you had last night? Anybody? Would you like to come up and share it with us? Oh, no. <laughs> Just kidding. But we all do dream every night. In fact, we dream multiple times every night. We each usually don't remember our dreams unless they're very vivid or very uncomfortable, scary, or if we have the same dream over and over again. One of the dreams I've had many, many times throughout the course of my life has to do with being in school. I want to find out how many of you recognize this dream. In the dream, I'm always in my high school, in a hallway, walking down the hallway, just, just on my way somewhere, and I pass an open door to a classroom. And I glance in the open door, and I realize, suddenly, I'm supposed to be in that class. But I've been skipping that class the entire semester, because I forgot that I had that class. Simultaneously, I'm very aware that the final exam is today. And I have not prepared at all for that class. How many have had a version of that dream at some point? Okay, look at all the hands. Research shows that about 40% of Americans have a version of that same dream. Psychologists actually have a name for it. It's called the recurring final exam dream. <laughs> Very creative. My guess is that so many of us have a version of that dream because of the pressure that we feel when we're younger to perform at school and by the stress that a final exam creates, and the added stress, we all know what it feels like to be unprepared. So we're in a series, actually the sixth week of our series called Jesus in the Prophets. We've been looking at prophets like Micah and Hosea and Zechariah and Isaiah, and it's been a kind of a challenging journey, if you've been following along. We've looked at all these ancient prophets and how they have pointed to God's promise that he's going to send a Messiah. And as Christians believe, all those promises are fulfilled actually in Jesus, the one who would come as our king, our shepherd, our advocate, and, as Isaiah said last week, the suffering servant. Now today we look at the prophet Malachi uh, and what he has to say about being unprepared. Now Malachi, as many of you know, is the very last book of the Old Testament. It dates to about... 400 B.C. or so. So by this time, the people of Israel have returned from exile in Babylon. Uh, the temple has been rebuilt. The walls of the city have been rebuilt. But even so, things are not good. Uh, the people believe that God has forgotten them. Uh, they've been doubting his goodness and his promise to actually restore their land. Uh, they've stopped paying attention to God's law. Even their priesthood has become corrupt. It's a time of great disobedience in the people. And like the prophets who came before him, uh, Malachi also affirms that God will indeed send his Messiah and that the Messiah will indeed bring both judgment and deliverance. So we're going to be in Malachi chapter 4, which is the very last chapter of the entire Old Testament, the very last verses of the entire Old Testament. Malachi 4, beginning in verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be as be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. And that's how the entire Old Testament comes to an end. Malachi begins with the day of the Lord. That's the first thing I'm paying attention to today, the day of the Lord. 
Now, many of you know um, that I played a little college basketball back in the day. How about that hair? How about those shorts? You can take that off now. That's enough. Um, so one of my clearest memories, thank you, one of my clearest memories of uh, playing ball in college was something called the 12-minute run. And here's how it worked. When we left school uh, in the springtime for the summer break, our coaches would tell us, okay, you need to stay in shape throughout the summer, and when you come back in the fall, the first day you're back, you're going to have a fitness test, a conditioning test called the 12-minute run. So we would get back to school, we'd all show up at the gym, they'd put us on a track, the coach would take his whistle and blow it, and we'd run as far as we could around that track in 12 minutes. That doesn't sound so hard, 12 minutes. Less than half of the time it takes me to do this sermon. Can't be that hard, is it? Can it? It actually is. And it's, it's diabolically hard. It's a form of torture, actually. Uh, because there's no way to survive a 12-minute run without significant preparation. Within two or three minutes of the run, you could already tell which guys had heeded the coach's warning and which guys had just disregarded it, didn't pay attention, and spent all summer having fun. It just took two or three minutes because they started to lag behind. You could hear their, their lungs struggling. And at about the 10-minute mark, some of the guys began to uh, get rid of whatever they had for lunch. Right on the track. Okay? And by the time the 12-minute run was over, it had become a day of reckoning, a moment of reckoning. It revealed very quickly and very clearly whether or not you had prepared. In case you're wondering... I was one of the ones who tended to prepare well. I think I finished second out of all the guys. Malachi makes three references here to what he calls the day of the Lord. Verse 1, surely the day of the Lord is coming. It will burn like a furnace. Then later in that same verse, and the day is coming, will set them on fire. Verse 5 then, see, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. So, what is the day of the Lord? Simply put, throughout Scripture, the day of the Lord refers to a day of reckoning, a day of judgment. Now, before we get into that and talk more about it, uh, there's also something else going on here. The prophet is telling us something that most of us just assume, uh, and that is that history is linear. Time is linear, uh, meaning it's not circular or cyclical. Most of you are aware there are great religions in the world like Hinduism and some other Eastern religions that teach a version of reincarnation, that when a human being dies, your soul is reincarnated into another body or life form and you get another chance. You may not know that the Pew Research Center has, has discovered that up to 25% of Americans believe some form of reincarnation. That's not what the Bible teaches. In Hebrews we read, is appointed the man wants to die, and after that comes judgment. So you get one, one chance, one chance to live. Time and everything that is, human history, the earth itself, the entire universe has a beginning, and it also will have an end. It's linear. Now, human beings have always been fascinated with the end of all things, with the end of the world. Dozens of books are written every year about that subject. Movies are made to show us how it could happen. How will the world end? Nuclear holocaust, alien invasion, global plague, some out-of-control virus, global warming, global freezing, zombie apocalypse. How's it going to end? And when will it end? Every year we see another prediction by someone who thinks they know. They've got inside information. Well, I can't tell you exactly how or when, but I do know this. I know that the world will end for everyone in this room Within the next 50 years, maybe 20, maybe less than that. The end is coming. The point is the end is coming for all of us. And in the immediate prophetic context, it means that God is going to judge the sins of Israel. While at the same time, he's promising to deliver those who have been faithful and righteous. And in the future horizon of prophecy, remember prophecy has a a present horizon and a future horizon. In the future horizon, the day of the Lord means that God's final judgment of all things is still to come. If we look ahead to the last book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation, we read this in chapter 20. 
Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, that's Jesus. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. Now, the New Testament teaches that Jesus came the first time as the fulfillment of prophecy, and he came as the suffering servant. Covered this last week. As the final sacrifice for the sins of the world. But the Bible says he will come a second time. And the second time will be much different than the first time. The second time he will come with exceeding power and glory as the king who is coming to judge all things. And the day of the Lord will mean two different things. To the unprepared, it will be a day of judgment. To those who are prepared, it will be a day of great joy and victory. First, let's take on what Malachi says. It will be a day of judgment. And that's the second thing we're looking at today, a day of judgment. When I was in about the third grade or so, I think it was, uh, I suddenly started having trouble in one of my class subjects. I don't remember uh, what it was exactly anymore. Uh, probably math. I mean, I've always had sort of a problematic relationship with math. Maybe why I have that, that recurring dream, I don't know. But I was, getting, um, when I was used to getting all A's and B's on my schoolwork. Uh, I started getting, uh, back when they used to actually give you grades, I started getting D's and F's. Lots of red marks on my paper, and I didn't I remember being confused. I didn't really know what I was not getting, but I, we were supposed to take all our work home and show our parents so they would know how we were doing in school. And I just was embarrassed, and I, I, was, I didn't know what to do. So I, just, I, I came up with a strategy. I would take all my papers home, but I would go first to my room, and I would take the bad ones and just slide them behind the bookcase in my room. Because they fit. I just slip them right down there, and they, they were gone forever, I thought. And I would take the good papers and show them to my parents. And so I thought, pretty cool strategy for a third grader. I was uh, home free. About a week or so into my plan, I don't remember exactly how long, um, I get home from school one day, and my dad is waiting for me, which is a little unusual, but I didn't think too much about it. And he says, uh, you know, how's, how's school going? And I said, fine, good. Uh, and then he said, have you been bringing all your work home? And I started to feel a little queasy about the direction of this conversation. So I said, um, yes. <laughs> and then he pulled out a wad of papers that has stuff behind the bookcase. Who knew that my mom cleaned behind bookcases? <laughs> Who does that? So you can say for me, that was the day of judgment. Malachi says in verse 1, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day is coming that shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. Now, this, if you're paying attention, is rather jarring language. It's not very politically correct, actually. Uh, as a whole, our culture is somewhat uncomfortable with the whole idea of judgment. We much prefer, again, I'm not saying you, but our culture much prefers the idea of tolerance. Right? Tolerance. That is, everything is fine so long as you don't hurt anybody. Uh, all belief systems are equally true. Just be sincere. God is whatever you want him, her, or it to be. It's up to you. And many people in our culture, I think, imagine God not as the holy one, but as the most tolerant one. The supremely tolerant one. Now, don't get me wrong. If by tolerance we mean a fundamental respect for all human beings, because every human being is created in the image of God, then tolerance is a very good thing. But if by tolerance we mean that all spiritual beliefs are equally true, or that all behavior is equally good, then it's a very dangerous thing. Most Americans believe that all you have to do to get into heaven is die. Let me say that again. Most Americans believe that all you have to do to get into heaven is to die. You see this all the time at, uh, at news shows and celebrity deaths and things like that. It's just the assumption. If you die, that's where you're going to be. I saw a poll once that said that more people believe 
if they have to pay attention to this one, more people believe that they will be in heaven than believe that there actually is a heaven. Meaning, of course, that most Americans don't believe in any form of judgment. I think it was Oprah who once said, my God would never judge anyone. Now, if she meant that God does not judge human beings in terms of value, that's absolutely true. We are all equally loved by the God who created us. But if she means that God does not judge human beings in terms of what we do, how we live, or how we respond to him, then she's very, very wrong. Not true. See, in a culture that's elevated tolerance to the highest virtue, we don't know what to do with a God who judges. And yet, here's the thing. I think we want a God who judges. For example, on any given day, if you pay attention to the news, whether you watch on TV or the newspaper, or you follow Twitter, you'll hear some story of a horrific crime. Like just last year, right here in West Chicago, uh, police found the body of an 18-year-old young man who had been stabbed, run over by a car, and burned by fire to death by other teenagers. And everything in us cries out for justice. Or we see stories of young women bought and sold as sex slaves. Or millions of children aborted out of convenience, and we cry out for justice. Someone needs to pay for these evils. Who wants a God who would not punish evil and wrong? We want a God of justice. That's why we're outraged. We just don't want him to judge us. When my dad found my hidden papers all these years ago, what I deserved was justice. But what I wanted was mercy, right? Malachi says the day of the Lord is going to bring both. To the unprepared, it's going to be judgment. To the prepared, it's going to be a day of victory. And that's the third day we look at that Malachi talks about, the day of victory. Back in my college days, um, I had a two-year course of study called Humanities. Uh, only you had to apply to get in it, and so I was in this course Probably didn't deserve to be, but it was a course that combined history, philosophy, religion, all in one. And uh, in one semester, I had a professor who was well known around campus as being legendary for uh, being a tough grader. Uh, it was almost impossible to get a B, let alone an A, in his class. His name was Dr. Max Polly, and behind his back, we all called him Max the Axe because it was really hard to get a good grade. Well, one of my college buddies was a guy named Bert, who eventually became a law professor, a really bright guy. He talked me into joining him and trying to beat Max the Axe at his own game and trying to ace the final exam. Um, he was a terrific student, so I kind of went on his coattails, and we decided the best strategy would be to try to guess the questions on the final. It was going to be an essay final, so we, we spent the weeks leading up to the final trying to guess the questions he was going to ask by listening closely, if there were any hints and what, is, what he, we thought he thought was really going to be hard and how he was going to trap us. So we tried to get inside his brain, and we wrote sample essay after sample essay after sa sample essay for weeks leading up to the final. And finally, the night before we were going to take the final, we were still writing essays. Uh, it was about midnight. We're up on the third floor of our, of our main building on campus. And I finally said, I'm done. I can't study anymore. I'm as prepared as I'm going to be. i got to take, take, take the results that come. So I left. Bert said he wanted to write one more essay, and then he'd be done. So the first thing in the morning, I, I go get my exam at 8 a.m., and lo and behold, we guessed four out of five essays exactly, almost to the word. So I wrote feverishly for three hours, knowing I was doing well. I, I was, I was going to do well, and by the way, I ended up getting an 89, which was a B-plus, the highest grade I got in that, in that, that whole, uh, whole semester. I didn't see Bert until after the exam was over. When I finally saw him... He had a big bandage on his head. And I said, what happened to you? And he said he had written that one more practice essay, finished at about 2 a.m., and was so convinced that he was absolutely prepared, that he was going to ace that final, that he was fired up, and he started running down the stairs. We were on the third floor, and jumping at the same time. And he jumped on the last one and saw high enough to catch his head 
on the underlying soffit and split his head wide open. Put his hand on it, drove himself to the emergency room, which wasn't close by, got stitches in his head, drove back, uh, took the exam at 8 a.m. without sleeping all night, and got a 96. (laughs) Two things about that story connect with the prophet for me. First is victory over our diabolical enemy. The second is Bert's exuberant joy at knowing he was prepared for that final. Prophet says in verse 2, But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Now there's a lot here. What's God saying? He says, For you who fear my name. That means those who worship and trust God for who he is. Those who are prepared, who are living in right relationship with him. For those, he says, the son of righteousness will rise. That's a reference to the Messiah. Remember, a few weeks ago, Isaiah chapter 9 said, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. Remember, we said, that's Jesus. John chapter 8, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The sun will rise, he says, with healing in its wings. Now, the Hebrew word translated wings there can also be translated as rays which makes more sense when you're talking about the Son, pointing to Jesus as well, who brings healing in three ways. First, physical healing. Jesus is known throughout the Gospels for healing all kinds of diseases and infirmities, the blind, the lame, the leper. Secondly, he brings spiritual healing. Jesus claimed to have the authority to forgive sin. Thirdly, Jesus brings ultimate and final healing, In the new heaven and new earth, Revelation chapter 21, and he, Jesus, will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne, that's Jesus, said, Behold, I am making all things new. The prophet then says, To the righteous you shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. Now, unless you grew up on a farm, that's a little bit of a foreign image. But the prophet's talking about the joy that is felt at victory. That is release from captivity. What I think of is uh, uh, our pet uh, Labrador Retriever uh, back before she died. If she'd been pent up in her crate for some time, if we let her out, she would just go tearing around the yard. Just You've seen your dog do that before. Just so filled with joy at being free. That's the image here. Then you shall... Tread down the wicked. This is a promise of ultimate victory. That God has not forgotten his people. That God cares about injustice. That God indeed will judge all sin and evil. So to summarize, Malachi is saying, the day of the Lord is coming. And it will be a day of judgment for the uh, unprepared and a day of victory and joy for the righteous who are prepared. And that leads us to the last thing we talk about. For those who are prepared, it will be a day of restoration. A day of restoration. Verse 4, remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Now remember, these are the very last verses of the entire Old Testament. The very last thing God says to his people for about 400 years. And in a way, some of it makes sense. He says, remember the law of my servant Moses. Now, what was the law? The law was that which established God's holiness and his authority. But the law also revealed the fallen and sinful nature of human beings. Then he says, I will send you the prophet Elijah. Now, right here, if we're, again, paying attention, we should be going, whoa, 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 wait, wait a second. Uh, didn't Elijah already come? Which is true. Elijah was a prophet some 500 years before Malachi. So this is a little bit confusing. And it's the New Testament that helps us understand. Luke begins his gospel story, the story of Jesus, by talking about John the Baptist. Look at Luke chapter 1, verse 17. John, uh, Luke writes, And he, that's John the Baptist, will go before him, that's Jesus, Listen, in the power, in spirit and power of Elijah. Whoa. 
to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So Luke is quoting the prophet Malachi, and after 400 years of silence, Luke says, John the Baptist has the spirit and power of Elijah, and that John has come to prepare the way for the Messiah, who is Jesus Christ. And it's Jesus who will then restore, it says, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of the children to the fathers. Now, we need to see this. Jesus is the one who turns hearts. That's what the prophet's saying. Jesus is the one who turned hearts. This is the gospel. Jesus, through his death and resurrection, offers us new hearts through the forgiveness of sin, new identity by adopting us as his children, new purpose by living for his kingdom, and new destiny to live forever in a new heaven and new earth. He will turn hearts. But notice, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to what? To the law? To the temple? To religion? No. To their children. He will turn the hearts of the children to what? To education? To political activism? To social media? No. He will turn their hearts to the fathers. Now what's this all about? Why does the entire Old Testament end like this? Well, I think this is a beautiful picture of the restoration of all things promised in Jesus. Perhaps the most famous story Jesus ever told is about a father and his two sons. We know it as the parable of the prodigal son. The word prodigal, you might know, means uh, extravagant, recklessly extravagant, so we could also call the parable the parable of the prodigal father. Works both ways. You know the story, the man has two sons, the younger son is rebellious, demands his inheritance early, goes out and spends all his father's wealth on riotous and wild living, finally comes to his senses when he's eating with the pigs, turns around and decides to beg his father for a job as a servant when he goes home. As he's coming home, we find the father is waiting for him. And the father runs down the path, throws his arms around his wayward son, and not only welcomes him, but puts a new robe on his back, new a ring on his finger, and then throws a huge celebration in a party for his son. What we see in that parable is that the heart of the son had turned away from his father. But the heart of the father had always been turned toward the son. And it's the heart of the father that allows the son to turn and come home. Now there are two things I see here, I think. First, you need to see that the heart of the father is turned toward you. The heart of the Father is turned toward you. Some of us find this fairly easy to accept because we've had earthly fathers that made it easy for us to trust the heart of our Heavenly Father. If that's true for you, it's a great blessing, as it is for me. But others of us have struggled right there. Maybe your earthly father was distant or harsh or angry or abusive or absent. And you struggle to believe and trust. Jesus says, you don't have to wonder if the Father loves you because his heart is always turned toward you. Jesus says, you don't have to wonder if you can trust the Father. His heart is turned toward you. Jesus reveals the Father's heart. And secondly, we need to see, I think God is saying something extremely important to fathers, to those of us who are fathers. And we can assume mothers as well. That is that Jesus wants your heart turned toward him so that you can turn your hearts toward your children. Why? That's God's design for our families. That's God's design for our homes. That's what God wants. When our hearts are not turned toward our children, the prophet says it brings utter destruction. And we see that around us all the time. The prophet is saying, God is saying, it's through our hearts turned to them that our children can most clearly see that their Heavenly Father's heart is also turned toward them. Will you bow with me as I close? Lord, we thank you today for your word. For the words of the prophets, for words of both warning and promise. 
Lord, we thank you that a day is coming when you will judge all things. We thank you for turning your heart toward us so that we can be prepared for that day. And for those of us who have children, help us turn our hearts toward them so that they might know your heart. And for those who don't have earthly children, help us to turn our hearts toward our neighbors so that they might know your great heart is turned toward them. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.